On January 3, 2020, Qasem Soleimani, the leader of Iran's Quds Force, was killed in a U.S. airstrike just outside Baghdad's international airport. The strike took place during a period of increased tensions between the U.S. and Iran, as a few days before, Iraqi protesters and proxy militias organized by Iran attacked the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. In the previous months, Iran shot down a U.S. military drone, and the U.S. dispatched thousands of troops to the Middle East as a warning to Iran. Following the strike on Soleimani, a key figure in the Iranian government, Iran launched missiles fired from inside Iran at Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq, which hosts thousands of U.S. troops. No Americans were killed, but 109 service members were diagnosed with traumatic brain injury. The attack made American retaliation a real possibility, given the months of recent tensions. But then two tweets made it clear both sides weren't going to take things further. At about 6 a.m. local time, Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif tweeted, Iran took and concluded proportionate measures in self-defense. We do not seek escalation or war, but will defend ourselves against any aggression. Shortly after, President Trump tweeted a message of his own. Missiles launched from Iran at two military bases located in Iraq. Assessment of casualties and damages taking place now. So far, so good. Both sides showed their intent not to take things further, provided that the other did not continue to escalate. The Iranians claimed they avenged their leader, while the Americans said the Iranian response was tactically futile and claimed victory for the killing of Soleimani. These two messages helped tone down a crisis in real time for the entire world to see. But while many leaders haven't often displayed their intentions so publicly, clear communication between world leaders is vital to de-escalating tensions. But because many conflicts take place rapidly, there usually isn't enough time for leaders to meet face to face. Instead, they will communicate electronically or through letters and messengers. In doing so, they must be able to communicate their intentions while not giving the other side the upper hand. Oftentimes lives are at stake, and even the entire world. In 1962, the US discovered through spy plane photographs that the Soviet Union was installing nuclear missiles in Cuba, an island just 90 miles from Florida. The US responded with a maritime quarantine of Cuba, setting off a tense two-week period of negotiations and threats. Both sides posed an existential threat to the other. The Soviets had nuclear missiles right on America's doorstep and could have easily taken control of the German capital of Berlin in the event of war. The US, however, had nuclear missiles in Italy and Turkey, a fact the Soviets were aware of. Further compounding the crisis, US President John F. Kennedy would not have survived politically if the offensive weapons were not removed from Cuba. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev had backed himself into a corner by putting the weapons in Cuba in the first place. From the American perspective, the nuclear weapons had to be removed from Cuba, but the Soviets didn't want to appear weak. With such high tensions, the need for clear communication was obvious. Any misunderstanding of intent could have led to irreversible escalation and all-out nuclear war. Khrushchev wrote a letter to Kennedy and used an analogy to demonstrate the need to find a solution. He wrote that the US and Soviet Union were both holding the ends of a rope with a knot in the middle. The more they pulled on the rope, he explained, the harder it would be to untie the knot. After a series of negotiations, the two adversaries came to an agreement to resolve the crisis. In exchange for the Soviets removing the missiles from Cuba, the Americans publicly stated they would not invade Cuba and secretly agreed to remove its missiles from Italy and Turkey. The Cuban Missile Crisis was probably the closest the two powers came to nuclear war, but fortunately they came to a solution thanks in part to an understanding of the consequences and clear communication that neither side wanted to make those consequences a reality. But the Cold War was still young and flashpoints in the future could be more dangerous. As a result, the two sides agreed to set up a hotline directly connecting the leadership of America and the Soviet Union. The hotline runs between the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia and the Kremlin in Moscow. The two sides can communicate via text as the hotline works like email. It has been used numerous times, including during the Six-Day War between Israel and the Egyptians and Syrians, the Yom Kippur War in 1973, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, 
in the Obama administration warning against 2016 election interference. Earlier in the Cold War, the United States was trying to decide on a strategy to counter the Soviet Union. Among foreign policymakers and the military, a debate ensued over whether to contain the Soviet Union or forcefully push back and try to bring about its demise. During the Truman administration, the top American diplomat in Moscow, George Keenan, composed an 8,000-word telegram to the State Department outlining his thoughts on the Soviet system and ways to counter it. He wrote that the Soviet government is cautious in its foreign relations and likely wouldn't escalate tensions with the U.S. From this telegram and other reports, President Truman settled on a strategy of containment aiming to restrict the Soviets' ability to expand geographically. The establishment of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and the doctrine of collective defense were key elements in the containment strategy and successful ones as the Soviet Union never invaded a NATO country. Because a reliable source in the target country was able to provide an expansive picture of the situation, the U.S. was able to choose an effective strategy for countering the Soviets. The containment strategy was not successful elsewhere, namely Vietnam, but it worked in Europe. However, not all communication is enough to prevent a conflict. In late July 1914, German Kaiser Wilhelm II and Russian Tsar Nicholas II exchanged 10 telegrams trying to avoid war. As third cousins, they signed the messages informally, so the telegrams have become known as the Willy Nicky telegrams. The messages contain what was likely a missed opportunity for peace. Nicholas suggested a peace conference take place at The Hague to resolve the dispute between Austria and Serbia over the assassination of Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Unfortunately, both sides began mobilizing their armies as a defensive measure and to reassure their allies. In the end, neither side could resolve the problem of alliance networks and the march toward war. The first telegram was sent on July 29th, and by August 1st, the two countries were at war with each other, and one of the world's deadliest conflicts had begun. Had they started exchanging messages earlier, maybe they would have been able to find a solution. Regardless, an exchange like this in the future might be effective in preventing a conflict. Additionally, the use of a telegram is not unlike communication systems in place today, to prevent misunderstandings and war from breaking out. Like a telegram, many phone lines in place around the world serve the purpose of keeping adversaries in contact with each other. Having lines dedicated to diplomatic and emergency use ensures leaders have the ability to communicate and hopefully de-escalate. During a crisis, general communication modes may be disabled or overwhelmed, and sending diplomats to negotiate may not be feasible due to time constraints or travel restrictions. Other countries have hotlines as well. There are ones between Washington and Beijing, North Korea and South Korea, and India and Pakistan. The most extensive of these is the Korean hotline. It is actually over three dozen phone lines used for both emergencies and daily interactions. The two Koreas use the lines to handle air and sea traffic and coordinate the limited commerce that exists between the two countries. Before an April 2018 inter-Korean summit, a hotline was installed directly connecting South Korean President Moo Jae-in's office with North Korean Chairman Kim Jong-un's office. Over the decades, however, the North Koreans have stopped communicating numerous times to protest South Korean actions like new sanctions and military exercises. With the communication lines physically in place, though, they would be available for use during a crisis. Communication plays a vital role in world politics. The world is a big place, and decision makers can't always meet face to face. Consequently, they must use phone calls, email, telegrams, diplomats, and even Twitter to get their messages through. When conveyed correctly, these messages can de-escalate a crisis or be used to help develop a coherent strategy. The Twitter exchange between Trump and Zarif likely helped prevent further conflict in the short term. The analogy Kurashev used put the nuclear standoff in simple terms and the U.S. and Soviet Union worked out a compromise. George Keenan's comprehensive analysis of the Soviet Union helped the U.S. government settle on an effective strategy for countering the communist state. However, when the messages lead to a stalemate or are delivered too late, there can be devastating consequences. Both happened with the Willy Nicky telegrams, as Kaiser Wilhelm didn't agree to a peace conference 
and the negotiations took place at the 11th hour. Existing communications hotlines like the ones between Washington and Moscow and North and South Korea will hopefully encourage countries to work together and prevent tensions from spiraling out of control.